Good day, everyone. Welcome to our second online session. The purpose of this class is to provide continued support for CW2. Presently, we have um, 14 participants. I'm hoping that some more of you join shortly. Before we begin, can someone please indicate if you're hearing clearly, you can use the chat function to let me know, please. If you're hearing clearly. Great, thanks for that. Could you also indicate if you are seeing the, if the audio is, is also clear, please use your chat function to let me know. If the video is clear, I'm sorry, the video. Thanks so much. Okay, so, so let's begin by having, let's begin by having a review of what was discussed previously. So I'm going to share a document with you. You will be able to view it in a few, in a few seconds. Good, could you indicate if you're seeing this document, it's entitled Issues in the Global Economy, Individual Case Study of Walmart. By chat, could you just let me know if you're seeing this document so we can proceed? Okay, great. So last day, we proposed a structure for CW2 as follows. The first section of this structure is the executive summary. This involves a discussion on the establishment of the importance of the topic, what will be discussed in your report, and a summary of the scope of your case study. To establish the importance of the topic means to say what the topic is and why it is important to be ventilated or to be discussed. So this topic is the evaluation of the impact of the activities of MNCs on host countries. And it is indeed an important issue because it's very contentious. So as you know, MNCs often produce desirable consequences, but they are oftentimes undesirable and detrimental consequences. For these reasons, the contention surrounding the impact of MNCs on their host countries, make it a topic worthy of discussion. So rather than begin, beginning your report abruptly by saying the purpose of this report is to discuss X, Y, and Z, it is often recommended that the first few sentences of your report capture the importance of the topic that is to be discussed. Then you will see uh, what the sections of your report will involve, and this basically refers to the various areas or the, of the body of the report that you'll be discussing. And finally, a summary of the scope of your case study. And that means to see the limitations or the parameters of your case study. This was discussed at length at last day, so I will not delve too much into it today. The second section of your report is globalization and multinational corporations. So you'll briefly define and describe the process of globalization explain how it has influenced the world economy since the 1970s. And this will be informed by your research from CW1. So much of this information has already been collected in your research at CW1. Then you will define what MNCs are, their history, their evolution, the establishment of modern MNCs, the sectors they impact, and the role that MNCs play in the globalization process. Again, this was discussed at great length last day, and I will not discuss it in detail today. The third and most important section of your report is a case study of MNCs. This will be comprised of four subsections. The first is a background to your chosen MNC. You will choose an MNC from this URL, give a brief history of your MNC, the country of origin, 
how the MNC was established over time, years of experience, sectors in which it operates, the product categories, amount of employees, continent, etc. The business model adopted by your company, asset base of your company, its main competitors and main customer segments. You may recognize that some of this information has changed slightly, and that is because I have amended this document. The revised copy has been circulated to you by email a few days ago. The second subsection involves a discussion on the impact of one developing country. Define what is a developing country, choose one from this UN list, discuss the positive and the negative effects. Some of that can be found on the last page of this document. So some positive effects of MNCs on their host countries involve FDI, job creation, tax revenues, etc. This was discussed at length last day, so it will not be discussed today. Also, also, some of the detrimental effects of MNCs on their host countries involve repatriation, exploitation of people, the environment, the government, congestion, etc. This was also discussed at length last day, so we will not pursue any further discussion. So coming back to the second subsection, discuss the impact on one developing country, choose from this list, any two positive impacts, any two negative impacts at max. And you should see whether the outcome on this developing country has been predominantly beneficial or predominantly detrimental. This can be discussed by trying to quantify the benefits and quantify the detriments. Then you would move on to a discussion on one developed country, define what's a developed country, identify from the UN list above, discuss two positives, two negatives. It doesn't necessarily have to be two, it could be one positive, two negatives, or two positives and one negative. And this depends on the position that you take. As discussed last day, if you want to take the position that your MNC has had a more negative effect, then discuss two negatives and one positive. If you want to take the position your MNE has had more positive effects, then discuss two positives and one negative and so on. Again, try to take a position and say whether the impact was overall beneficial or detrimental and then compare the impacts of your MNC on both the developed and the developing country. So let's say if your research, if your comparison research reveals that there were more adverse impacts on the developing than the developed country, you should say why. Perhaps the developed country, the government is more stringent with more established, with a more established framework of legislation. The Kuznets curve theory suggests that in developed countries, the education level of society is more elevated and therefore they are more concerned about environmental protection. And for these reasons, in your comparison, you should be able to say why there are more adverse effects in developing as opposed to developed countries. So after you have concluded your discussion on developing and develop, you should conduct a comparison of the impacts on both. The final section of this section is emerging issues and policy implications. So whatever issues that you identified previously, you will say, what are the areas that require strengthening and so on. Your final section is conclusion and recommendations. Summarize your main research findings. And these were some recommended areas that were discussed at length last day, which we will not discuss again today. So this participants is a review of, a brief review of what was discussed last day. For today's session, however, I have uh, an actual report from a previous student of 2019. The student graduated with first class honors. She scored very high in this uh, report. So she has given us the very gracious permission to utilize her material for discussion and learning for everyone's benefit. Please do not copy the contents of this report. As you know, Tinitin checks for plagiarism. And the purpose of this, of showing this report is 
to help everyone score a higher mark and its intention is for really, really for all of us to learn together. So let's begin, let's begin with the first section of this report, which is the executive summary as you are aware. So the executive summary in this student's report reads as follows. The purpose of this report is to critically evaluate the impact of multinational corporations, both positive and negative, on the MNC of its host countries. In addition, emerging economic opportunities and challenges presented by globalization in relation to MNCs as well as policy implications and recommendations will be discussed. Evidence will suggest that MNCs have a detrimental impact on host countries. The chosen MNC is Walmart. So let's say what is good, what is not so good, and what could be improved. What is good is that this executive summary gives a clear overview of all of the sections of the report that will be discussed. It's like a preview for what the reader can expect. The executive summary is also good because the student tells the, the reader the position that will be taken. So the student says evidence will suggest that MNCs have a predominantly negative impact. This, this executive summary is also good because it identifies the MNC for discussion. But based on our recommended structure that was espoused last day, what do you say, what, do you, what can you identify is lacking from this executive summary? What is weak about it and what could you do to improve it? I would like anyone, if you could identify how you could improve this executive summary to score a higher mark, can you type in, in your chat, can you type in what you would do to improve this executive summary? So I've said what is good about it, but you identify what is lacking based on the structure we discussed last day. So type in, in your chat function, anyone, what would you do what would you do to improve what would you do to improve this executive summary okay good so i'm getting some i'm getting some feedback here so we have um, one recommendation something that shows why mnc is important yes do we have any other do we have any other any other recommendations from anyone what else would you do what else would you do so someone says, yeah, from Vanessa, put the countries to be examined. Yes. Any other, any other recommendations? Other things are still absent from this executive summary. An intro line, yes, Bridget. Uh, the intro line, Bridget, should be along the lines of what Kemba has said, something that shows why this discussion is important. So let's tackle that first. Let's tackle that first. What, what, I, would, what I would begin by saying, rather than discussing very abruptly the purpose of this report is to do x y and z remember remember we had we had stated last day that it is often worthwhile to begin by establishing the importance of this topic so had it been me this is how i would have begun i would have begun by by having an opening sentence something to this effect it is argued that MNCs often produce many benefits for their host countries, including FDI, job creation, and knowledge transfer. However, it can be equally counter-argued that MNCs produce several detrimental effects to their host countries, including exploitation of the environment of people and of governments. So that statement participants, that statement participants clearly clearly indicates why clearly indicates why this issue is worthwhile of discussion you could probably use data if you wish let's say you conducted research and williams 2015 argued that mncs are very important because they have provided billions of fdi to their host countries however williams also argues that mncs have produced several detrimental effects which exceed the billions of FDI they have produced on their host countries. So the idea, students, is that you should establish before, before, the, before the outline, you should establish the purpose 
of the discussion why it is important. It is important because MNCs, their activities are very contentious. It is widely debated whether the impacts of MNCs are good, bad, in between, etc. So that is how you want to begin your report with two lines stating why this issue is being discussed. So that was very good. What else? Something is also missing from this executive summary for it to score full marks. Can anyone indicate using a chat function? So we had some contributions from Kemba, from Bridget. What else? What else would you add to this executive summary to score full mark? Try to recall what was discussed last day. You can refer to your structure from last day's class. Type in, in your chat function. What would you do, anybody? How can you improve this further? And these were clear guidelines given by the university as well. Anyone in your chat function, can you say how you would improve this executive summary? Right, so we have, um, we have from uh, Natalie make a recommendation. Uh, actually, Natalie, that is, that is not a requirement for the executive summary. Thank you for that contribution though, but something is missing. If you refer to this very clearly stated in the structure I provided, very good, thank you, Bridget. Uh, you are required to give the scope of your report. So let's review, let, let's go back to the executive, to, to the recommended structure. The scope, the scope of your report, remember this? And this was clearly indicated by the university that you should say, what does the scope mean? The scope means the limitations of your study and how, how would we address that? How would we address that in your executive summary? So in your executive summary, after you've stated the why this issue is important and after you have given the outline, you should say the scope of this report is limited to a discussion on one MNC, one developing and one developed country with comparisons being made to others. So the idea here is this is not an exhaustive discussion. We are not having case studies on multiple MNCs, nor are we having case studies on multiple developing countries or multiple developed countries. We are focusing on one MNC, one developed and one developing. Granted, there'll be comparisons with other MNCs, but it is important to say what is the scope, meaning the parameters, the, 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 the limitations of, uh, of your report. So that was good. So now we, know, now we know how to write a very good executive summary to get full marks. The next section is globalization and MNCs. So again, let's compare this, let's compare this with, our, with our structure. In this section, you should see what is globalization, its process, how it has influenced the world economy. Then discuss what are MNCs, their history, the establishment of MNCs, and the role of MNCs in the globalization process. So let's check to see if this student covered all of these ground, grounds. Right. So globalization and MNCs, it reads as follows. Globalization is the inexorable process where an abundance of economies and countries are integrated, interrelated, and interdependent. Nicely done, that is the definition, it's very precise. Globalization has been popular since the 50s and so on. Global events also transpired between 1820 and 1914. So this student is saying that globalization is not new. It has been in existence centuries ago. Globalization has reached its highest from 1913 onwards. The factors that contribute to globalization include reductions in trade barriers, lower transport and communication talk, costs, information and communication technologies. I think this was adequate. I would not recommend any further discussion because all of this was discussed in detail at CW1. So I would not recommend more than a brief paragraph as the student has discussed here. Remember the purpose of this assignment is to discuss MNCs and their role in the globalization process. So let's move on now to 
a discussion on MNCs. So this student says an MNC is a business organization whose headquarters are located in one specific country encompassing branches and subsidiaries in foreign countries worldwide, a nice definition, a bit on the old side. Please remember your journal articles should not be more than 10 years old for currency of information. So a worst case scenario, 2010. In the 20th century, MNCs have grown and developed at a rapid rate. For example, the majority of products and services that consumers buy on a daily basis are inherently supplied by MNCs. We have a good reference here. Due to the intense growth of MNCs, they have successfully contributed to the integration of the world markets and toward world trade and industrial production. The history of MNCs were linked to origins in and between cultural communities and so on. MNCs play an important role in the globalization process. Now, this is important. MNCs play an important role in the globalization process. This was something that the university clearly said you should discuss. So this student argues, firstly, Levitt stated that the world is homogenized. Customers are demanding similar products, encouraging world trade between MNCs, which is linked to the globalization process. Well, she has the idea. It was not explained very clearly there, but the idea is correct. Secondly, the global dispersion of production where competing MNCs from a number of economies have established geographically dispersed value chains to take advantage of lower research and so on. So this student is arguing that MNCs play an important role in the globalization process for two reasons. Firstly, they contribute to homogenization by offering standardized products. I think that is what the student really meant to say. And they also contribute to the dispersion of production. Now, students, you could completely ignore these and give other reasons for how MNCs play an important role in the globalization process. As you know, MNCs move people, MNCs move capital, and MNCs move products. Consider, for example, the movement of people. It is not uncommon for MNCs to recruit and select persons in their home country and assign them a job opportunity in a host country. The converse is also true. Similarly, it is not uncommon for MNCs to use substantial amount of FBI from the home country by injecting it into the host country. Also, MNCs transfer funds between host countries and finally, MNCs are responsible for the movement of products. MNCs may create products in one country and sell it in other countries of the world. So for those reasons, the movement of people, products, and capital, we can show that MNCs are contributing to globalization process, to the globalization process. The largest section of this report, students, is a case study on your chosen MNC. This student has chosen Walmart. And let's compare, let's compare from, let's compare with, I'm sorry, the recommended structure, what we expect to find. So I would expect to find an introduction to your MNC, a history, the country of origin, how this MNC was established over time, years of experience, its scope, the sector in which it operates, main product categories, the amount of employees, continents and countries, whether this MNC is a PLC LTD, the business model adopted by your MNC, its asset base, its main competitors and main customer segments. So all of those areas are what we expect to see in the overview of Walmart. Let's see if the student covered all of those. overview of Walmart. So Walmart is the largest retail MNC in the USA. So the student is indicating that Walmart has its origins in the USA. It was founded in 1962. Its headquarters is in USA. The sector in which it operates is a retail area. Walmart is a hypermarket that offers groceries, clothing, pharmaceuticals, electronics, 
So she is indicating the categories, the product categories, Walmart employees. Walmart has approximately 12,000 stores in 28 countries worldwide and, and serves 27 million customers a week. Walmart employed 2.3 million employees worldwide as at the end of 2018. Its competitors include Costco, Target, Carrefour, Kmart, and so on. According to McKinsey, Walmart, as a, the data revealed, a quarter of US productivity growth is attributed to the retail industry. And Walmart has one sixth of this, of this market share. So I think a lot of areas have been discussed here, but there are some things that are missing. The student did not discuss the source of competitive advantage. Walmart, as you know, competes using a low cost leadership strategy. Michael Porter argues that companies may use multiple strategies, differentiation, niche, and so on. And one is a low cost dominant strategy, and that is the business model used by Walmart. That could have been discussed in this section to give the reader a clear overview about how this company operates. What is also absent is there is no information telling us about the monetary value of this organization. What is its asset base? Is it a PLC, LTD? If it's a PLC, how much, how much would a share be sold for on the stock exchange? So some of these are areas that you could, could have added, included to improve this section. Following your introduction to your MNC, you are now required to discuss the impact on host countries. So ideally, you should discuss the impact on one developing and one developed country. So this student has not specified whether this discussion is developing or what it pertains to developed to a developed country. So the reader is not clear, and that is something that should have been done. As we review, it seems that the student is about to discuss China. So, so China may, it may be argued that China is a developing country. What is also missing here from the onset, uh, I would have said what is a developing country and then indicate that China is the country for evaluation. One benefit of Walmart on China is job creation through FDI. That's a good point. MNCs play an essential role in contributing toward employment creation in host countries, benefiting host countries in the long run. Employment creation is supplying persons with labor for opportunities to receive remuneration. I like that the student has defined job creation, meaning, meaning participants. Remember, you do not want to have a story. Your discussion should not be a story. This is an academic report, which means that yes, you must have examples and so, but there must be an appropriate fusion of theory and evaluation that complements your example. So the student very nicely defines what is job creation. What is missing, however, the student did not define what is FDI, and that could have also been defined. What could have been also, what could have been included also is theory. So some theory is lacking, meaning theory that shows any relationship between FDI and employment creation. What I'm trying to say, participants, is this student is saying her first benefit is employment creation. There should be some theoretical discussion of employment creation on FDI. If that is your point, then please define what is FDI, please define what is job creation, and then say if there's any link between FDI and job creation. And there is indeed a positive correlation. It would have been nice if the student could have found research to suggest that, let's say for example, Williams 2015 argues that there's a positive correlation between FDI and job creation, which indicates that when there's a inflow of FDI in developing countries, there's a increase, a corresponding increase in employment creation. So participants, you would observe that I am, I am having this discussion at length 
because I want to emphasize the importance of having adequate theory, which I find is lacking in the student's discussion. So the student is saying employment creation is needed because it helps to increase GDP. Very good. What would be better is if the student had indicated by how much GDP increased in China, Walmart's entrance into China created high employment levels. Walmart had 376 locations in China and hired 100,000 employees, 99% of whom were Chinese. I like this for the mere fact that it is data heavy. There are numbers, a period is specified, the amount of locations in China, the amount of employees have been provided. So remember students, you always score higher marks when you could provide data, when you could quantify your argument. This argument here is job creation and we have appropriate data. 376 locations, 100,000 employees in the year 2020, 99% of whom were Chinese. Excellent point. As a result, it led to successful globalization. Walmart adopted its global strategies by establishing a typical uniform, by establishing its typical uniform hypermarkets in different Chinese provinces and so on and so on to tailor to the Chinese community. Due to this, Walmart was successful in China by understanding Chinese culture. A similar MNC Carry4 provided employment creation in China. Carry4 established 100 stores in 12 years and employed 40,000 people, 98% of whom are Chinese. This is also good. The student is comparing Walmart with a rival Carry4 and the activities of Carry4 in China. What is lacking, however, is I feel there could have been deeper discussion, meaning what was the outcome of this job creation? Granted, the student did say that the student did say that GDP rules, it would have been better if we knew by how much. What was missing is the impact on society, meaning how did this employment creation impact the Chinese society? Did people enjoy a higher standard of living? Was the evidence. Were products more available? Provide evidence. Were prices lower? Provide evidence. Um, did the Chinese nationals have more options, more choice options, provide evidence, and so on. So what I'm suggesting is that after you have identified your point and you have developed it with adequate theory, you should discuss the outcome. What is the outcome at a country level? GDP increase, very nice, but tell us how much. What is the outcome at a societal level? How did it affect the Chinese citizens? Did did their standard of living improve? Did they have more choice, uh, more availability of goods and so on? The student is now moving on to sweatshops and is indicating that this is a negative impact on the Chinese society. If we scroll down, there's another point, crowding out, which is a negative impact. So right away, we see that the student has discussed three points. The first point was one positive, job creation. And the second was sweatshops, a negative. And the third is crowding out, another negative. So we see that there are three points being discussed here. One positive and two negative. I think this is nicely done. It is in keeping with what, it is in keeping with what was said at the executive summary. The student said that evidence will suggest that MNCs have a detrimental impact on their host countries, meaning that the reader can expect to find more information on negative consequences and less information on positive consequences. So let's proceed. We have discussed, we have discussed the first positive employment creation. I told you how this can be improved by infusing a greater level of theoretical content by including more data on GDP, by including the impact on how the citizens had benefited. Let's proceed with our second point, sweatshops. This is a negative point. 
It reads as follows. A negative impact of MNCs on its host countries include sweatshops. Sweatshops are industrial, are enacted in industrial and developing countries due to fierce competition for factory jobs. This is kind of old, the reference. Yes, it seems to be a journal article, but very old. One negative impact Walmart has had on China is sweatshop labor in the toy, in toy factories. Again, kind of old. Sweatshops are unethical practices by MNCs where employees are exposed to unfair wages, unhealthy and unsafe working conditions for long hours of work and no overtime remuneration. This is a nice point. It really captures why sweatshops are considered to be undesirable. Sweatshops are detrimental because it lowers the standard of living. Sweatshops in Walmart have been persistent since almost two decades, negatively affecting China. This is a nice and very new reference, so we are happy for that. Workers in Walmart toy factories were exposed to excessive force over time, wage violations, unsafe working conditions, and unaccept unacceptable canteen food. Walmart has been able to exploit China to take advantage of race to the bottom production costs. So this is a really good attempt to introduce theory, but it was not defined. The student just merely mentioned race to the bottom, but never said what race to the bottom is, never defined what race to the bottom is. What would have been better? I would like anybody, could anyone tell me what could have been really good that this student could have included to score extra marks? Could you, if you have any ideas, can you type it in your, your, your chat function? So I'm saying yes, the student's point is on, this point is on sweatshops. Should he find sweatshops, give a his, gives a history, all of the undesirable points about sweatshops. Then she says, um, this has happened because of race to the bottom. The student did not define what race to the bottom is. But can anybody say further, what could have been included what theoretical discussion could have been included to really make this argument strong? Anybody type in your, in your, in your, in your chat function. If you have any ideas, what could you have included further? It's something theoretical that could have really strengthened this point. Anyone, if you have any ideas. Any ideas? Yes, so I'm receiving some some suggestions um, from Sheldon, ramifications of this theory. Yes, Sheldon, I like your thinking, but I wanted you to connect the dots further. Let's see if we could get more. Um, from Kemba, government policies, yes. The lack of labor laws not being enforced from Alicia. Yes, uh, do we have any other do we have any other ideas on what could have been included in this paragraph to strengthen the discussion further? It's something theoretical. So we have some some ideas and I'm going to build on Sheldon's point, the ramifications of this theory. And what would have been really good is if this student identified, if the student identified a correlation between race to the bottom, between race to the bottom practices and sweatshops. So that would have been excellent. So yes, the student defines what are sweatshops. The student de forgets to define and say what are race to the bottom policies or practices. But what is Missing even further is a correlation between race to the bottom and your point, which is sweat, sweatshops. And there's a strong, there's a strong correlation. Data will suggest that in countries where race to the bottom practices are conducted, that there is a, an abundance of sweatshop factories. So a correlation between the two variables would have been ideal. It's similar to what I was discussing previously. In this first beneficial point the student made, 
she spoke about FDI and she spoke about job creation. She defines what is job creation, forgets to define what is FDI. But what would have been really good is if a discussion on the correlation between the variables. And yes, there's a correlation. Let's say your research reveals Williams 2015 states that in countries where there's a high injection of FDI, there's a higher level of job creation. So my point is here, you really want to try to identify correlations and that shows a higher level, a higher level of evaluation, a higher level of thinking. So good, that was a good point. The student discusses crowding out. I particularly like this point and I like it because the student was very creative. In, in, my, in my negative point last day, I had repatriation, exploitation, exploitation, um, transfer production, congestion, etc. But I never had any point on crowding out. So I'm really happy to see that this student was thinking independently and conducted her own research. So students, I cannot stress enough. I cannot, I cannot emphasize how important it is for you to conduct your own research and identify your own positive and negative impacts. So this student discusses crowding out. Let's read further. A negative impact of MNCs on host countries is crowding out. Crowding out refers to a practice by which, a practice by which substantial entry of firms lead, leads to a closure of local business sectors and industries thereby being detrimental to host countries. Basically what this means students is you would have heard about the infant industry argument. Fundamental economic theory suggests that when MNCs go to a developing country, they often compete with the infant industries. Infant industries have not grown substantially to enjoy economies of scale and they have not yet obtained an optimum scale of production and therefore MNCs tend to crowd out these infant industries resulting in their closure. A very good point. It can be noted that when Walmart acquired Mass Smart in South Africa, the government was concerned that the presence of Walmart, presence of Walmart would negatively affect the stability of an abundance of industries and so on, resulting in deindustrialization. So yes, uh, the student is giving details on what her point is on what crowding out. So at this time, she is still explaining what is, uh, what is crowding out. Let's continue with our discussion. As a result, Walmart's presence in South Africa led to a reduction in demand for local products, very good, which resulted in the closure of an abundance of local manufacturers, etc., such as in sectors related to textiles, foot footwear, leather, plastics, very good details. I'm happy with all of this. What would have been better is if we had data numbers. How many firms closed down? Um, the monetary value of the loss of business. How this negatively affected local GDP. So yes, the student is making a very good point that there was a closure of a number of local businesses. This would have been better with numbers to substantiate your point. Say how many businesses closed down? What was the dollar value loss of this to, to Africa? What would have been good also is if there was a comparison with another MNC showing a similar undesirable, a similar undesirable effect in South Africa. The student goes on, the student goes on to say whether the overall impact of Walmart was predominantly positive or negative. You would recall from, you would recall from your structure, after you discuss positive and after you discuss negative, you should say whether your research reveals that the impact was predominantly beneficial or detrimental. So let's see how the student explores that. The student says Walmart 
had a predominantly detrimental effect on its host countries. For example, Walmart created high employment opportunities. Yes, she did say that. Walmart did create job opportunities. Walmart, however, Walmart contributed to sweatshops, which caused employees to experience devastating consequences on fair wages, forced overtime, unacceptable canteen food. Walmart's Chinese workers were paid 2.04 per hour, whilst its minimum wage was 4.12 per hour, not only resulting in a lower wage, but an infraction of the laws for wage conditions in China. So the student is attempting to say very, and this is a very good attempt to show that the effects of Walmart in China were predominantly negative. What would have been even better is if she had quantified. So let's say, for example, if their if there, her first benefit was employment creation, if we had a figure, let's say Walmart created $2 billion worth in salaries for Chinese workers. So that would have been a quantification if you could get a dollar value. Sweatshops, let's say if you could get a dollar value that the loss of income amounted to $5 billion. Student says crowding out. It would have been good if we had a dollar value. Let's say crowding out led to $3 billion in closure of domestic businesses. So then we could have very nicely compared now that the positive was $3 billion in job creation, but the negative was $8 billion from crowding out and from, and from sweatshops. So it's always good when you could quantify using um, numerical values, and that always helps to give credence to your arguments. So participants, if we come back here, case study on Walmart, recall you are to begin with an overview of your MNC. We discussed that previously. Then you are to discuss an impact on two host countries, one developing and one developed. So the student discussed China, right? And then the student proceeded to discuss challenges and so on. So what is really unfortunate is that the student, and I included this here, the student neglected to have a discussion on a developed country. So that would have been, that would have been, that would have resulted in a lower mark. And since the student did not discuss a developed country, the student was not in a position to provide a comparison of the MNC's impact on both developing and developed. Recall students, recall from our structure. In our structure, we are to discuss one developing, positive and negative. You are to discuss one developed, positive and negative. And then you must compare, you must compare the impacts of the MNC on both the developed and developing country. So let's say your research reveals that more adverse consequences were found in your developing country relative to your developing country. This is a comparison you should make and then say why. If there are more adverse consequences in a developing country, could anybody tell me why do you think it is likely that there will be more adverse consequences in the developing country than in the developed country? Anyone, could you type in in your chat function, why, why do you feel that there are always going to be more adverse effects in the developing rather than developed country? Anyone? Feel free to share your ideas. Yes, we have, um, we have some ideas here. Very good. Sheldon saying that developing countries have a desperation for FDI, yes. And because of this desperation, it results in race to the bottom. It results in governments relaxing labor laws, environmental laws. Yes, Bridget says, lax regulations from Ian. Laws are weaker in developing countries. Excellent points relative to developed countries. Do we have any further points? You may also argue that 
there's likely to be more positive consequences in developed than in developing countries. And why is that? The converse of these reasons apply, and also the Kuznets theory suggests that in developed countries, there's a higher level of education, a greater level of consciousness about environmental protection. So there will be social pressure on MNCs to keep their activities in check. So this is why it is important to compare the impacts of both the developed and the developing country. After you make that comparison, you are also required, you're also required to discuss emerging issues and policy implications. Let's see what the student discusses here. So the student, after she had discussed uh, China, moves on to a discussion on economic opportunities. This is not required, students, um, you do not need to discuss this, but nonetheless, let's read it. Globalization has presented MNCs, such as Walmart with distinct opportunities. Globalization creates the opportunity for MNCs to tackle global environmental issues, including climate change, global warming, and carbon emissions. Now, this could have been a good point. This could have been a good point for, this could have been a good point for the positive impacts of MNCs. I have some points here, but remember students, I said that this is not this is not an exhaustive list. So there are other benefits. And one benefit that the student just made is that MNCs have the potential to improve the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals, including trying to limit climate change, to reduce the size of the ozone layer. So all of those are some of the positive impacts that MNCs could have on your home, not home, I'm sorry, on your host countries. Let's continue with that discussion. So the student says that one opportunity is to enhance sustainable development goals, including reduction of carbon emissions, reduction of global warming. Sustainable development involves incorporating environmental, social, and economic aspects, contributing positively to a flourish economy, a very nice definition. It's very current, it's 2015. And MNCs play an important role in SDGs. So we know, for example, BP has an environmental policy. Not only does that enhance the reputation of BP, but it contributes to the environmental and social and socioeconomic goals of countries, also to their SDG accomplishment. The student says that MNCs play a significant role in SDGs. She's arguing that there are 17 SDGs, and that is correct. There are 17 SDGs. This reference is not the best. If you log on to the UN's website, that's a 20, it's updated 2020. The United Nations indicates that there are 17 SDGs. The 17 SDGs, some of them include elimination of hunger, equal opportunities for women in the workforce, eradication of illiteracy, and so on. There are 17 of them. I cannot readily identify all 17, but they are listed on the UN's website. Try to avoid references that have no dates. No date references are obviously not credible, or I shouldn't say not credible. It may lack credibility. Try to use references that have a date and have an identified author. The student is developing her point here on SDGs, and she says in 2009, Walmart introduced plans for inventing a sustainable product index where products would be rated on the basis of distinct environmental and social criteria. After a few months, Walmart invented plans to eliminate 20 million tons of carbon emission. I really like this point for the fact that there's data, there, there are numbers, there's a time period. So it's not a generic point and it's not a bluff. The student has strong data and a reference. Thomason, 2015. Due to this opportunity, society and countries would benefit exorbitantly 
from a reduction in pollution and persevering wildlife. I think this was a really good point. Um, let's move on to economic, economic challenges. Again, your, your assignment does not require you to discuss economic challenges, but we can discuss this uh, in any event. The student says the existence of MNCs in foreign countries, MNCs experience distinct challenges, and no date, no date, again, not the best. One challenge presented by globalization in relation to MNCs include cultural disparities, Cultural disparities involve differences in preferences, values, and beliefs. Opponents argue that cultural differences in host countries threaten the operations of MNCs. Now, the student is going on a very slippery, slippery slope because you are not required to discuss the challenges that globalization presents on MNCs. It is the opposite. In this assignment, you are to discuss the problems created by MNCs. So not the challenges that globalization poses to MNCs, it is the opposite. You are to discuss the challenges or the problems or the issues that MNCs create in the globalization process. So the student is arguing that it deprives the MNC of the opportunity for product standardization, et cetera, and so on. And all of this is really irrelevant. I would not even read it any further because you are not required to discuss impediments that globalization produces for MNCs. You are required to discuss the problems that MNCs create for host countries in the globalization process. So I would not discuss this point any further. It was really off track. Um, student goes on. A second challenge created by globalization is tax havens. Tax havens are countries or parts of countries that offer MNCs low rates or elimination of taxes for foreign investors. Tax havens are regarded as threat as it ultimately poses risks to governments, etc. Walmart is transferring profits from its global operations into low tax. Luxembourg causing Walmart to pay low taxes instead of repatriating to the USA. I'm sorry, not repatriating, but paying it in the US where it would be subjected to a higher tax. Walmart does not have any operations in Luxembourg, but instead has 22 shell operations where these companies offer Walmart very low taxes. From 2010 to 2013, Walmart's Luxembourg subsidiaries were accused of paying less than 1% tax on $1.3 billion of profits. And this is a threat to the US government. So again, this is indeed a good point. Uh, we, we discussed that we discussed that one of the one of the adverse one of the adverse negative impacts of MNCs is transfer pricing, tax avoidance, and taking advantage of tax havens. So it was well discussed here. The student says that Walmart paid less than 1% taxes in Luxembourg. So the adverse consequences here are twofold. Firstly, it denied the US government of its right fair of uh, it's, it's, a, it's duly noted amount of taxes. So it deprived the US government of its due taxes. And it also did not really benefit Luxembourg because a minimalistic amount of taxes, I am sure, I am sure this is lower than the uh, required rate in other jurisdictions. So rates to the bottom policies would have also diminished the amount of taxes that the government of Luxembourg would have benefited from. Policy implications. You, as you're aware, as you're aware in your structure, you have to discuss emerging issues and policy implications. So what are the emerging issues, students? These emerging issues refer to, refer to what you discussed previously. What were the negative issues in your developed what were the negative issues in your developing countries? 
and what areas require strengthening, what areas require, require strengthening to mitigate these issues. Let's see how the student discusses that. The student says, policy implications. Due to tax haven practices in Luxembourg, there should be need for greater regulations, including the role of government in monitoring their activities and the enforcement of FATCA, Foreign Account Tax Compliance Act, which is law enacted by the US government, etc., requiring that foreign institutions declare their US account in foreign countries. A very good point. But could anybody identify what is missing from this policy implication? In fact, to identify FATCA here was not needed, you know. Identification of FATCA would have been better in recommendations. In this section, all that you are required to do is to identify the areas for intervention. So clearly the student is saying, the fin she didn't say financial, but she should have said, the financial sector and the role of government in developing stronger regulations or enforcing those regulations if they're already in place. That is what should have been said. But apart from that, students, could you tell me what is missing from this policy implication section? Um, it is supposed to follow a logic. So something is absent, and I discussed this last day. Could you tell me, could you tell me, um, anybody, what could be improved in this policy implication section? Also, it is overly short. It is nothing more than five lines. So what could be improved? Anybody? What is missing here? What is absent? Can you tell me what is absent? In your chat, anybody, please feel free to tell me. Do you have any ideas? What is, what is absent? Let me give you a hint. Try to recall the earlier parts of this student's report. So I will scroll up and you will see the student began by, by talking about, yes, these are benefits. So if they are benefits, then this does not require intervention because it's something favorable. This is an undesirable consequence, sweatshops. This is another undesirable consequence, etc. And um, in challenges, the student discusses tax havens and so on, right? So those are areas that went before, those were undesirable areas. And then in policy implications, the student only mentions here the need for government regulation with respect to the financial sector. So that is a hint. Tell me what needed to be, what needed to be included in this policy implication section student anybody anybody yes so we have we have some ideas from kemba uh, implementation of policies kemba actually implementation of policies might be better suited suited for your recommendation section do we have any other any other ideas what is missing something is something does not logically flow in her policy implication section Remember, policy implication must naturally flow from what was discussed before, but that didn't happen here. Something is missing. Something does not logically flow. Anybody, do you have any other ideas? What does not logically flow? Very good. So we have, we have, Somebody is saying here, strengthen labor laws relating to sweatshops. And that is exactly the point. Thank you for that point. I believe it's from Ramona. Thank you for that point. And that is exactly what needed to happen. Let me connect the dots for you students. Um, if you are arguing that there are sweatshop issues, then clearly there needs to be better monitoring and enforcement of labor laws. So that is what needed to go in your policy recommend, in your policy implication. The need for improving and strengthening labor laws or to formulate labor laws if they are not existing. Because remember, you have just made the point that sweatshops are an issue. Excuse me. 
also if you are saying that crowding out is an issue that mnc's enter your country and they it results in a closure of local industries then there needs to be some level of restriction on how many MNCs can enter the country, the scale of operations that they are allowed to end, they are allowed to operate at, so it does not compromise the local business. So what is, what is missing here is in policy implications, this student discussed three problems. The first problem was sweatshops. The second problem was crowding out. The third problem, the third problem pertained to tax havens. Three problems. Yet in your policy implications, you're only identifying the need to solve one problem. So this needed to follow students. It needed to follow logically from the previous sections. So in this section, you should have such, it should have been connected to what was discussed previously by saying the emergence of sweatshops in China, the proliferation of sweatshops in China require, require or suggest or have implications for labor laws to be better monitored, to be developed if they have not been developed for governments to ratify the international labor laws, if they have been ratified, for them to be better policing, etc. Also, there are policy implications for how MNCs operate and the scale they are allowed to operate at, because it results in, the student said it results in, it results in crowding out. So my point is participants, remember that your that your remember that your policy implications needs to follow from what was discussed previously. This student did not do that. She only discussed the, the tax haven issue, but neglected the policy implications for the other issues that were mentioned, including sweatshops and crowding out. Also, this is, this is way too short. We recommended that your, that your emerging issue should be 200 words and that this is way too short this looks less than 100 words less than 100 words to me this is 77 words so obviously it's not obviously it's not developed adequately and you will recall policy implications was very clearly stated by the uh as a section they want to be discussed also your last section is conclusion and recommendation. Remember students, in all reports, there's a sequence. Conclusion must precede recommendations. Here, the student gives recommendations before conclusions. So the conclusion should have appeared before. before. Let's read the conclusion. In conclusion, and remember I said students, you can avoid saying in conclusion. You can use words like, the aforementioned discussion reveals that, or data reveals that, or research suggests that, or research has suggested that, or revealed that. There have been both positive and negative impacts on Walmart, on its host countries, and um, opportunities and challenges were evaluated, and policy recommendations were identified. This is a bit this is a bit too vague. In your conclusion, if you say the positive and negative impacts were identified, remember you're supposed to summarize very briefly what were the positives. So the positive in this case was job creation. The negative was sweatshops crowding out and exploitation of tax havens. The recommendations should have been identified in a line or two. So your conclusion is a summary of all of the main points discussed. This doesn't summarize anything here. This is way too generic. It doesn't, it doesn't tell the reader what went before. Let's read the recommendations. Remember, remember some of the recommendations we proposed 
last they include legislation, both domestic and international, self-regulation, MNCs can adopt codes of conduct, codes of ethics, they can govern their own activities through the use of CSR campaigns, social regulation from pressure groups, international regulation from signing on to treaties like the United Nations conventions on the protection of employees, also by ratifying the policies of international organizations such as the ILO, students ratify means to implement, and a number of other, a number of other recommendations Recall, I suggested that you cannot discuss all of them, but perhaps one or two in detail. And the recommended, the recommended, the, it was recommended that you spend about 200 words, 200 words here. Let's see what the student suggest, what the this, what this student discussed. One policy recommended that should be implemented to combat the emerging challenges in relation to MNCs include the Financial Action Task Force. I like this point, it is very specific. It was identified by name. It pertains to the European Union Commission. It's a new reference, so marks will be awarded right away for being specific and for having a new reference. The Financial Action Task Force comprises of 31 members, including the European Commission and 50 other EU member states. Its objective is to identify uncooperative states and to eliminate and destroy money laundering activities. Very nice to discuss. This index citation is wrong. Students, I know many of you use shortcuts. There are these online site generators, and this is what happens when you use site generators. I can tell the student you did used an, uh, uh, a reference generator. When you use reference generators, they always end up in errors. I never use those generators. For example, who can tell me what is the error in the citation? Anybody, and had it been me, I, did, I would deduct half a mark right away. And I saw other similar errors in the student's index citation. Yes, we have um, very good Kristen and very good Kavita. There's no .org and very good Ian. There's no .org. There's no .org in index citation. It should be global policy. In fact, whatever is the name of the organization or the name of the author, that should have been stated here, comma, 2002. So there's no .org at any time. If you read your Harvard referencing rules, and if you have forgotten it and you wish to have a copy, please feel free to email me. I'll be happy to send you a copy. You can also email Jude and it's also available free from the UH Canvas website. There's a section called CASE, C-A-S-E, Center for the Academic, Center for Academic Studies, something. I can't remember what it is at this time, but please follow your, your protocols for Harvard referencing. Remember you score up to 10 marks Sometimes it really, it really, it really is sad when I see students scoring one mark or two marks in referencing because this is a easy area to, dis to score eight or nine marks. Imagine if you do not have the best report. Let's say your report is worth about 60 marks, but you score very high in referencing, 10 marks. 60, 60, 60 plus 10 is 70, so you could have a, a very nice, final score with strong referencing. We have some questions here um, from, from Jude. Yes, I will, also, I will also provide it again if need the reference. Laziness. La <laughs> yes, so um, la laziness. I have, ne I have never used generators in my life, please. Your program manager is on the ball here and he's hit the nail on the head. Laziness is what causes the use of generators. Um, from Kemba, should recommendation be based on problems that was mentioned in your case study or should it be general? That's an excellent question, Kemba. Yes, and you're absolutely, you're absolutely right. The recommendation should be based on the issues that were identified before. Students, remember, remember there's a logic 
there's a logic to your report. Let's review this logic. The logic is this. What are the issues in the developing countries, the negative ones? What are the issues in the developed countries? And these issues are what you would identify as the areas that need policy, that have implications for policy. What areas require, require strengthening, whether it's labor law, whether it's financial law, etc. So the output students of this section is what would create the input for this section and what would naturally follow from the policy impl implement from the policy implication is the recommendation section. So the recommendation is where you will actually go on to suggest what needs to be improved, identify the recommendation, say where it has worked and so on. So let's review this student's work. This student recommended the Financial Action Task Force. That was excellence. She says what it involved. And then she says, due to tax havens in Luxembourg, the financial task force is recommended to implement enforcement of tax havens and so on. What could have been better here is if this student said, uh, give any evidence of how this financial action task force worked in a previous country. Tell us, yes, you're giving a recommendation, but has this been used by any other government? What was the outcome? Was it old talk? Was it successful in eradicating the tax avoidance issue or the tax evasion issue? So tell us what has been the outcome of your recommendation of your recommendation thus far. Okay, so students we have we have had here, this is an actual report from a previous student, and it is very useful to help us identify common mistakes, what are strengths, and what you could do to overcome these errors, how you yourself can strengthen your report to score the highest mark possible. And I always like to get examples. This student was very generous and gracious. She did not have to give me permission. Some students are reluctant. Um, and remember, the purpose of this program is for all of us to learn collectively this student has very generously shared her material. So she is transferring her learning to us. And this is what you call altruistic behavior. She has nothing to benefit from this, but she is very graciously allowing us to use her work so that we can benefit. And I would like to encourage that all of us continue on with altruistic and benevolent practices for all of society to benefit. So I'm sure you would have benefited from this discussion also, what I did with this report is I correlated it with our recommended structure. So you see the structure in action. At this time, I would like to open the floor for any questions, clarification. Although throughout the session today, we have had a number of contributions. Students have um, been giving their ideas, asking questions, and giving recommendations for what could have been improved in this report. So at this time, the floor is open. Um, any question you would like to ask, it could also pertain to your own research. I know some time has gone between last Saturday and today. So I know many of you would have commenced research. I know some students have made tremendous progress in your research. So if you encountered any kind of stumbling blocks, anything you're not clear about, anything you would like to ask pertaining to uh, what your research has revealed such facts thus far, any concerns with the structure, any question you would like to ask pertaining to today's discussion. So the floor is open, anything, anything that you would, you would like to say, please feel free to do so now. You can type in the, using the chat, anything that you would like to ask. Any questions? So before I before I adjourn the session and log off, uh, let's let's just summarize what was discussed today. So before we conclude today, we had a review of last day's recommended structure as follows. This was this document was revised. It would have been circulated to you by June sometime last week. 
This is the proposed structure, the executive summary. You know what it involves. The next structure is globalization and MNCs. You know what it involves. The main section is the case study section, which has four smaller sections, a background to your chosen MNC, uh, the discussion on your developing country, the discussion on your developed country, the policy implications. Your final section is your conclusion in which you summarize your main findings and your recommendation. So we, we reviewed the structure lastly. You also have the revised version of it by email. In today's class, we have had the good fortune to review another student's work. This student is a first class honor student. So this is, I would say, this report is generally good practice, not best practice by any stretch of the imagination. We see that several areas were lacking. We know how to improve them now, but I would say definitely good practice. She has a very good writing style, very precise, lot of, lots of examples, credible information from credible references, etc. Today we saw an example of an executive summary. We also saw an example of what you should say in this section called globalization and MNCs, um, the history of MNCs, more importantly, the role of MNCs in the globalization process. This is something you should research. You could Google search. An example of a Google search could be role of MNCs in the globalization process, impact of MNCs in the globalization process, etc. You can play around with your keywords to increase your Google searches. Today, we, we were able to see what your case study should involve, an overview, a background of, a background to your, a background to your MNC. It should involve a discussion on the host countries, the positives, in this case, employment creation, the negatives, in this case, sweatshops, crowding out, and also, also the, and also the tax havens, and also, also the tax havens, the tax havens point. We saw that what was missing, we saw that what was missing from this report was the student had no discussion on the developed country. And because there was no discussion on the developed country, it was not possible to have a discussion or a comparison rather with the developing and developed. So that was sadly lacking and that would have resulted in a low mark. We also saw an example of what is the policy implication session, section. This should follow logically from what you discussed before. The policy implication section should be about 200 words. So this was a bit too short and also this section did not logically follow from what was discussed before. This student neglected to say that there were policy implications for labor laws and policy implications to prevent crowding out. The object, the conclusion and recommendation section, we saw what is an example of good practice. What would have been better is if the student had discussed two recommendations and given actual real world examples of where this recommendation has been implemented, in which country, and what has been the outcome. So students, I trust we have had a very, a very productive session today. Next day, we will continue to provide much needed support for CW2. Remember, we want to score the highest possible mark. CW2 is 70% of your final grade. It is really up to you uh, to, determine, to determine how well you perform. So we have a few questions here. Okay, from, from um, Kemba, should recommendation be based on what was mentioned in, key, in your case study because I'm not seeing where the recommendation is linked. Okay, so, so I would just like to answer that, I would just like to answer that question. So Kemba, this is, this is, this is, what, this is what is supposed to happen. Let's just, refer, let's just refer to your structure again, right? In your structure, you're discussing the impacts on your developing country. 
the positive impacts are fine, meaning that we have, there's nothing to fix because we are happy for the positive impacts. It's the negative ones that we are concerned about. So you identify the negative ones in developing, you identify the negative ones in developed, and then you say the policy implications to mitigate these negative ones. From this example that we have discussed using the student's work, the policy implications will clearly be for the financial sector, for the labor sector, and for any sector that manages crowding out. The recommendations, Kemba, are actual, these are actual um, suggestions that would respond to your policy implications. So the policy implications are, yes, what are the areas that are strengthening, that require strengthening? In the policy implications, you're not making an you are not making recommendations here, you know. You are simply stating, based on the problems you identified before, what are the implications? What needs to be better monitored? What needs to be better patrolled or policed? What needs to be developed? What needs to be regulated? What needs to be monitored? What needs to be strengthened? So Kem Kemba, at this section, you are not recommending. You are just saying, what are the areas that have implications? Your recommendations is where you will now state the actual suggestion that would respond to policy implications. So Kemba, I'm not sure. I, I um I I'm not sure if that clears it up for you. Um some other some other statements here we have from Bridget. Thank you for your very detailed information today. Other presenters should look at this recording and see patterns. Oh my. Okay, uh, Bridget, thank you. Thank you for um, your kind words from Farah. Today's session was very informative. Thank you um, from Farah. Today's session was most helpful. Thank you, you're very welcome, Farah. I would like to try my best for everyone to score the highest mark from Ramona. Yes, thank you again, you're welcome, Ramona. From Kemba. Oh. I understand, I understand, Kemba. You said to disregard your your previous question. Yes, I understand. And um, from Kemba, thank you for the explanation. It is clear on how you're welcome, Kemba from Mariel. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mariel. I hope that the session has benefited you and um, you can score the highest mark, the highest mark possible. Do we have any other questions? Any Anything that you would like to say from Crystal? Thank you, sir. Did you provide a date for your review? Yes, this was given to you in an email. The email has the revised version. It has the revised version. I think the deadline I stated was, yes, I think it's third or the fifth, I can't, I can't remember. But if you read your email, you will, you will definitely see it. From Rihanna, thank you, sir. As always, information was most helpful. You're welcome, Rihanna. I'm happy this session helped you from Dimitri. Thank you, sir, for the helpful information as always. Dimitri, you're, you're welcome. Um, from Akil, Akil is saying that the, the deadline I gave for review is the third, yes. So please try to meet the, the deadline. Remember, reviews are provided on a first, on a first serve basis. So you may send, this is what happens. You might send your, your, your assignment for review on the third, and you might expect that I respond on the fourth, when in reality, I would have received 20, 20 or even more assignments before you. So I cannot, re, I cannot, I cannot review your work one day later. You, all, you always have to be mindful students that there are assignments that would have been submitted before you and I'm always reviewing chronologically. It's a first serve type of basis. Remember the, the date and time is 8 a.m. on, on uh, April the 3rd. I will not be reviewing material that is submitted beyond this date. We have to be respectful of deadlines. So please, please submit your material by the, by the desired time. Um, from Nakisha, from so Nakisha, Nakisha has a comment here from Nakisha. Much thanks as always. Nakisha, you're welcome. From Akil, thank you so much. Appreciate it. Again, Akil, you're welcome. 
Kavita Maharaj, thank you. Everything is much clearer now. Kavita, you're welcome. I hope, I hope that you have benefited from this session. Remember, if you are not able to participate online, it is recorded and it will be uploaded at a subsequent time. You can always view the recording from the last session. And that also provides a very detailed discussion of the structure. I previewed it today, but a great detail. It was discussed last day, so please feel free to um, view the video recording. Good, so I think, I think we have had a very productive session. If we have no further, if we have no further questions, I'm going to adjourn the session. Thank you for your participation, students. I'm happy to see that many of you have benefited and I'm really heartened with all of your positive comments um, for the work that I do at this, this college. Thank you so much. So I'm going to adjourn the session and I'm logging off. Thank you. Please, from Sheldon. Sheldon says thanks. For, so thank you, everyone. I'm happy to see that you are participating and that you are contributing and working hard. I'm going to adjourn and log off at this time. Please have a good afternoon. Take care.